touch anything else. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, thank you for sticking with us uh, these few minutes. Uh, we had technical difficulties. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Peter Haug. He's a family medicine physician and epidemiologist. Uh, he's worked for many years at the CDC in the United States, and he has a lot of uh, experience. <coughs> Um, we have here have him today uh, to talk about uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, PPE and triage. Uh, so uh, I hope you you um, learn from this uh, lecture. Thank you, Dr. Hoke. Great, great. Thanks, Denise. Uh, can uh, can people hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, it's certainly nice to be here this morning. Uh, with those of you, uh, with first of all with Denise, those of you in Bangladesh and wherever else you might happen to be. Um, as Denise mentioned, I'm a family physician by original training, but an epidemiologist by later training. And um, I worked with the CDC until about six years ago. Been a med global volunteer uh, frequently in uh, Greece and more recently in Colombia. Haven't yet made it to Bangladesh, I'd certainly like to at some point. Um, Denise asked me today if I talk about two things. <clears throat> First of all, the use of, of personal protective equipment, PPE, and also a little bit about triage. Uh, as luck would have it, I just finished revising the state of Washington's um, PPE conservation guidelines. So um, it's something that was fresh in my mind. So anyway, without further ado, let's move on and let's see if this works. I hope the screen changed. Denise, everything okay? Good. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about use and conservation in a shortage setting, which I assume is the case in Bangladesh. It's certainly the case here in the United States and especially here in the state of Washington where uh, PPE, especially um, N95 respirators and surgical face masks have been in short supply for the last um, you know, four, four months since uh, the COVID pandemic really hit here. So we, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about N95 respirators, surgical masks, gloves, uh, eye and face covers, and gowns. On the right, you see a picture of uh, MedGlobal's uh, uh, clinic in Cucuta, Colombia, <clears throat> and you'll see some people wearing PPE. The guard on the left wearing a surgical face mask and has gloves on. The nurse in the center has a gown, gloves, and an N95 respirator. I happen to notice, does anybody notice anything wrong with that picture? Look, look at the, look at the, the nurse's N95 respirator. The, hanging at the bottom of it is the second strap. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, it's really important on an N95 to have the thing fit tightly. Okay, we'll, we'll get on to that a little bit later on. Um, why is it important? Well, to prevent transmission, particularly among healthcare workers. High demand, the supply has been, has been disrupted. Here uh, in, in the state of Washington, the State Department of Health put in an order for something like who I believe it was, it was almost a hundred million dollars worth of PPE, especially N95 masks, masks from several companies and has received very little of it. Plus there've been quality issues. It's been a real difficult situation uh, here as I imagine it probably has been for those of you in Bangladesh. So conservation measures have been needed, not just for N95s, but also for gowns, for surgical masks, and so on. It's been very important to monitor the supply and demand of all of this stuff so that you can anticipate problems. Okay, now, uh, the picture on the right, uh, one of our med global physicians in Colombia, and he's wearing gloves, uh, an N95 respirator, and over that respirator, um, a face shield. We'll talk about the importance uh, of uh, face shield use as a conservation measure a little bit later on. He's probably taking care, well, he's taking care of a, of a pregnant woman, probably very, very low risk 
uh, but he's still using full uh, PPE except for a, a, a gown. Okay, here's some sources of guidance. <clears throat> uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, websites that have good guidance, uh, guidance from the UK, guidance from the from Euro CDC. Um, here are just a few. The one at the top from the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, is uh, uh, the one one of the ones I've used a lot. Uh, the next one, uh, the Infectious Diseases Society of America. I would highly recommend this to you. Uh, the IDSA recently, this is in the last month, did a very extensive review of all the available literature on especially um, N95 masks, surgical, surg uh, surgical masks, uh, shoe covers, and face, face protection and gowns. And they took a very critical highly structured look at the evidence to come up with eight different recommendations. And the nice thing about this website of IDSA is that they not only tell you what the recommendations are, but they also give you an idea of just how good the evidence is uh, to support those recommendations and somewhat about how they reach their conclusion. Now, <clears throat> um, I don't know how many of you have had the questionable pleasure of being on committees that write guidelines. I've, I've done it a couple of times and what many people don't realize is that many of the guidelines, perhaps most of the guidelines that are written for almost anything are not based on real hard evidence. There are just not randomized controlled trials on everything you possibly have a question about. And even if there are things in the literature about it, what's in the literature is usually not exactly what you want to know. It may be about a different disease, for instance, influenza versus COVID, uh, the, the, the original SARS uh, uh, disease versus COVID, but just not quite the, the right thing. So <clears throat> you end up having to take the available evidence and do the very best you can with it. And sometimes it's, it's a, a very well-educated guess. So you're gonna find among the different sets of guidelines that, that you look at, uh, m usually subtle, but sometimes fairly substantial differences. And it just depends on uh, how the people who wrote that particular set of guidelines interpreted the available data and what data are available. As I said, oftentimes they have to simply make the very, very best uh, educated guess they can about what to say. Okay, so the World Health Organization, the third um, uh, citation down there, has a very good website on this. And then two interesting things at the bottom that are, are critical, and those are how to put on and take off PPE. As we'll talk in a couple of minutes, it's very, very critical. It's not just the technical performance of, say, an N95 mask, how well it filters out virus particles in the air, but it's also how you put it on and how you take it off. And if you don't do it right, the protective effect of the, the piece of equipment can uh, really be uh, at some time, sometimes completely neutralized. You can actually increase your risk of becoming infected if you do it wrong. So look at, <clears throat> look at those, those last two um, uh, references for really uh, detailed guidance on, on how you put it on and how you take it off. And we'll talk a little bit more about specific situations in just a few minutes. Okay, now you're gonna, uh, at least in the IDSA and CDC guidelines and also in WHO, it'll talk about three different settings for PPE use. <clears throat> the first is what uh, some call the conventional setting where there are no shortages. And in this case, people generally discard disposable PPE after one use. They see one patient, they throw it away uh, um, or, or they send it to the laundry. Con the contingency setting is where you're facing possible shortages. You think maybe you're going to run out of N95s, maybe you're going to run out of face shields, and you want to start thinking about using PPE conserving measures that do not reduce safety. And the third setting is what uh, some groups call the crisis setting. And that is where you have actual shortages, to a total lack of some PPE, for instance, a total lack of N95 respirators or a total lack of surgical masks. 
And some of the things you may do in that setting don't quite measure up to usual uh, uh, clinical standards. For instance, uh, there may be a shortage, of, a total lack of gowns, in which case uh, some people have used plastic garbage bags with a hole cut out for the head and, a, and holes cut out for the arms. And actually it's probably fairly effective uh, uh, at, at protecting the wearer. So these three, three use and conservation settings are important to keep in mind and we'll refer to them more as we go along. Okay, uh, CDC makes a big point about <clears throat> reducing the need or the demand for various things, sometimes through engineering controls, what they call engineering controls. Isolating patients in a private room that, where the door can be closed, uh, using physical barriers like plastic windows at the reception desk, curtains, and so on. And if you happen to have a ventilation system, um, Try making sure that the air moves from the clean side to the contaminated side, so you're not blowing virus particles towards your healthcare workers. Uh, consider triage outside and consider treatment outside if you can possibly do that. And I know some, some of these things, by the way, I know are, are probably gonna to be totally irrelevant to how you practice in Bangladesh. I don't know the exact situation having never been there. Um, so bear with me if I say things that sound a little bit strange for your particular setting. <clears throat> okay, the other thing you can do are what have been called administrative controls, limiting the number of personnel, healthcare workers who have contact with, with COVID patients, just to those who are necessary. Limiting the family, <clears throat> the number of family members who accompany uh, patients in clinic, minimizing the number of family caregivers for hospitalized patients, cohorting in patients who have confirmed uh, COVID-19. If, you, if you're really sure that these, all these people have <clears throat> um, this disease, you can take care of them all in one ward or one unit or one part of your clinic and have them cared for by designated teams of healthcare workers uh, so that you reduce the total, the total need for, uh, for uh, protective equipment. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can screen for respiratory illness before patients enter the facility. We'll talk about that in the triage part. Um, and if, I, don't, I don't know if you have any testing available. Uh, at least here, what many hospitals are doing is testing anyone who's gonna come in for an elective uh, uh, procedure or an elective admission before they, the day before they come to the hospital. And that way they know if uh, they're an asymptomatic uh, but infected person. Okay. <clears throat> Then there will be two types of care mentioned. One is care that involves aerosol generating procedures or AGPs. Uh, aerosols are of course the very small uh, particles uh, that are suspended in the air for some time. Uh, they're usually less than five or 10 microns in diameter. These can either be generated by a cough or a number of things we'll talk about in a second, or they can be, they can be generated from um, respiratory droplets, which are larger particles that then become uh, these very small particles as the liquid in the droplet evaporates. And they can remain suspended in the air for some time. The other type of care is routine care, and that being simply uh, care not involving uh, an aerosol generating procedure. Okay, uh, and there are a number of different lists of what what uh, include aerosol generating procedures or AGPs. Uh, here are two from, two from the CDC and two from WHO. Uh, things like um, sputum induction, suctioning, intubation, extubation, um, sputum, uh, sputum collection. Uh, you can look at these, uh, we'll, we'll get you these slides by the way. You can look at those references at the bottom. I hope you can see them. I, I couldn't make this any more clear. I apologize for the somewhat small font size. And then a couple other things to think about are uh, dental procedures. Uh, in, here in, in the state of Washington, dental practices have been closed for the most part uh, during the last few months of the pandemic. And they're, as they're reopening, people are realizing that if you use a, a regular dental handpiece, a drill, or some of the ultrasonic uh, instruments that they use for cleaning teeth, you're gonna generate an awful lot of aerosols. And so there's a big need for PPE in dental clinics. 
Uh, as it mentions here, there's less certainty over the, the production of aerosols, uh, infectious aerosols with nebulizer administration or high flow O2. And the, you'd have to consider whether the, the, the flu, the medication you're nebulizing is actually uh, contaminated or not. Okay, so here's this, this idea of AGPs and uh, the risk of infection. Uh, and uh, this is a look at the risk of transmission of SARS, the original SARS-1 disease some years back to healthcare workers either exposed versus not exposed to aerosol generating procedures. So this is an odds ratio here and the 95% confidence interval. You may recall the odds ratio is somewhat like a relative risk in that it's comparing the risk of people who were exposed to AGPs versus those who were not exposed in a, in the, uh, uh, through aerosol generated procedures. There's a long list here of things that have an elevated odds ratio. And that means that the risk of uh, infection is greater if the healthcare worker was exposed to an AGP versus not exposed. Uh, however, only four of them are statistically significant um, elevations. In other words, the 95% confidence interval does not include one. So here you got tracheal intubation, a, an odds ratio of 6.6. .6. That means that the people, uh, ex the healthcare workers exposed to this procedure uh, were 6.6 .6 times as likely as those who were not exposed to that procedure to become infected. And the confidence interval uh, is it does not include one. So this is a statistically significant association here. The same thing for uh, tracheotomy here, an odds ratio of 4.2. Remember, this is 4.2 times the risk and a significant confidence interval. Um, Non-invasive ventilation, the same thing. And uh, let's see, where was the last one? and manual ventilation before intubation. So these are the things that produce aerosols, the very fine particles that are suspended in air for some time and uh, can infect people some distance away from where they're being done. Okay, now this is the IDSA, the Infectious Diseases Society of America algorithm for appropriate PPE in conventional and contingency or crisis settings. You'll find this figure on that IDSA uh, website. And this will just give you an idea of kind of the overall scheme of what we're talking about. <clears throat> so here we have healthcare personnel caring for patients with suspected or known COVID-19. And the next thing is it makes the big point as IDSA does throughout their documents and CDC does as well, that all of this has to include a total, a, a package of appropriate PPE. Not just, not just N95 respirators or face masks, but gowns, gloves, and eye protection. And especially this part here, as we said before, taking it off, donning, and, or putting it on, donning, and taking it off, doffing, uh, being done correctly. And one of the big deals about how you put it on and take it off is whether you touch things or not. Uh, if you, for instance, if you touch the front of your uh, N95 respirator, you can contaminate your hands with virus particles. If you then touch your face with those hands, uh, you can um, uh, infect yourself by way of your eyes or your mouth or your nose. So how you do it, how you put the stuff on and take it off is really critical. And those two um, references we gave earlier have good detail on how you're supposed to do that. Okay, the next thing down is here in the conventional setting when you have good supplies, the non-AGP procedures where IDSA says you can use a surgical mask or an N95 or better. We'll talk about the differences between an N95 and an N99 in just a second. Uh, or in uh, care that involves an aerosol generating procedure where everybody says you need at least an N95 and you can possibly use it. And then of course in the contingency or crisis settings where you either think you're gonna have a shortage or you actually have one, it's the same sort of thing. What do you do for non-AGP care? Use a surgical mask or a reprocessed N95 mask, or respirator, we'll talk about that too. Or in AGP care, a face shield, 
uh, or surgical mask to cover your N95 or use a reprocessed N95. So this is sort of the general scheme of how you might want to think about the use of PPE in, uh, as you're caring for patients with COVID. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here we have some differences between N95 respirators and surgical masks. And I apologize if everyone knows about this already, but some of this I think is kind of interesting and, and, and I know it's a surprise to many people. So N95 or an N99 or N100, these, these masks are made of electrostatic polypropylene. It's not just the physical filtering of uh, aerosols or, or, or whatever, dust out of the air. There's actually an electrostatic charge that's developed inside the mask itself, inside the structure of it, that attracts uh, the, the um, aerosol particles or the dust particles or whatever, which also have a charge, and prevent them from moving through uh, the filter material. And this is one of the reasons this electrostatic charge property is one of the reasons why these N95 masks or N99s are so good. Uh, the surgical masks are made of various materials, uh, but they don't have this electrostatic charge property. The, N, the N95s provide very high level user protection. In some cases, also protection for other people. The surgical masks protect both the user and other people. And if you think about it, a surgical mask, you use it in surgery. And the idea is not so much to protect the surgeon or the nurse, but to keep the surgeon or the nurse from essentially spitting <laughs> Uh, into the surgical field is to protect the patient, not as uh, much more so than the uh, healthcare workers. Now, an N95 respirator filters out 95% of particles that are at least 0 0.3 microns in diameter, that's down into the aerosol range. An N99 mask filters out 99%. And there are, there are other varieties as well. Um, surgical mask is, uh, filters out splashes, droplets, and larger particles, but does not filter out aerosols. As we mentioned before, an N95 or N99 is suitable for uh, taking care of patients when you're doing an aerosol generating procedure, not the case for the surgical mask. And part of the reason for that is not only the structure of the N95 mask, that has this ability to take out very small particles, but also the fact that the N95 or N99 should be fit and seal tested. Fit testing is when you make sure that you can actually develop a seal for that particular user. And the way this is, there are a number of ways of doing this, but it's not simply putting the thing on and, and going off to work. You're supposed to go through a regular fit test to make sure it fits your face. For instance, People, men who wear beards, uh, N95 don't work very well because they don't give you a good tight seal. Before you use one, before you go see the patient, you should do, <clears throat> you should do a seal test to make sure it's working that day. The surgical masks, on the other hand, don't seal around the edges. Just remember, you can stick your finger underneath your surgical mask very easily and there'll be a gap there. Because again, the reason for wearing a surgical mask is to protect yourself against big, big things, splashes, droplets, and so on. Um, an N95 can be decontaminated or reprocessed, uh, and they can be reused. Uh, surgical masks can be reused, but decontamination is not recommended because they're, they're simply not, in general, um, rugged enough to take, to take that process and still remain effective. <clears throat> but of course, an N95 and so on is much more expensive. Uh, I believe that they cost at least $3 a piece here and probably more. I have no idea how much MedGlobal's paying for the ones that you're using. Uh, and surgical masks are relatively uh, less expensive, but in some places I know are still very expensive because the supply is so short. The N95 comes in two different versions. <clears throat> One has a valve, that's the medical version, and the other doesn't have a valve. That's the surgical version. The valve is simply that, that thing you see in the center of some of these masks that allow you to breathe out easily. An N95, if you've ever worn one, you re may recall that it can be kind of difficult to breathe through it because the polypropylene 
has, is a, has a very tight structure and it can be difficult to breathe. So this, for the medical version, they have this one way valve that allows air to get out of your mouth or away from your face very easily, but then seals as you take a breath in. Now for surgery, that's a problem because, and for protecting other people, that's a problem because as you breathe out, you can breathe out uh, particles, you know, respiratory droplets and so on through that valve, which would contaminate either the surgical field or the other people. So a surgical N95 does not have this one-way valve in it as a medical valve does. Okay, so here are some of the first, um, the first recommendations. So this is for N95 masks in the conventional setting, no shortages. For routine care, that is no aerosol generating procedures, use either a surgical mask or an N95 or better respirator. In other words, an N95 or an N99 or an N100. That's IDSA's recommendation. The CDC says for that, should use an N95 or better in, in routine care where there's no shortage. For AGP care, everybody says use an N95 or better. Don't use a surgical mask. And of course, in this conventional setting of no shortages, you can simply discard your PPE after every patient encounter. Now, it's interesting, again, again I, I mentioned how IDSA uh, presents uh, quite clearly what evidence there is behind their recommendations. And there is some controversy about whether you should be using a surgical mask for routine care of any COVID patient. And this, uh, I hope you can see this. Again, I was not, I took this from another publication from IDSA guidelines, and it was a little difficult to get a clear, a clear copy. But what they did is they looked at um, comparing the N95, the risk of, of infection for a healthcare worker, an N95 with the risk for using a, a surgical or medical mask, same, same thing, on the transmission of laboratory confirmed viral respiratory tract infection. And they looked at the odds ratio, again, the comparison of risk between the two, uh, the, the two uh, types of masks from four different publications. And you, here you see the odds, the odds ratio from a very, very small one, which means an N95 is very much better than a surgical mask up to um, uh, very high odds ratios, which indicate that the N95 is very much worse. The risk is higher than it would be for using a surgical mask. If you have an odds ratio of one, that means the risk is essentially the same. If the uh, confidence interval for that odds ratio includes one, then the, there's no significant difference between the two, the two masks. You can, see there, you can see here for the four different studies, the point estimate or the odds ratio is right at about one for this study. It's negative here, it's a little bit negative there, but, and it's right around, uh, it's right on one for this one. But the confidence intervals cross one in all four cases. So when they put them all together, they got no difference between uh, the risk when you're using an N95 and the risk when you're using a surgical or a medical mask in this case. This was not for this was not for the SARS COVID virus. This is for a bunch of other re viral respiratory tract infections. So again, this is one of those cases where you have some evidence, but it's not quite what you want. But this is part of the evidence that they use to make their recommendation. Okay, contingency or crisis settings where you have possible or actual shortages, routine care, no AGPs, use either a surgical mask or an N95 or better, and the N95s can be, de can be decontaminated or reprocessed N95s. That's the IDSA uh, recommendation. The CDC says in this shortage setting that a surgical mask can be used for routine care if the patient also wears a mask. So you're in the room with a COVID patient, you don't have an N95, you can use a surgical mask if the patient also wears one. And that's using source control for the patient. You're trying to keep the patient from spewing viral particles out into the air that you're breathing. And uh, in that case, CDC says, you're okay to use a surgical mask. 
Uh, but you need, CDC says you need to use an N95 or better if the patient is not wearing a mask of some kind. Um, for AGP care, both CDC and IDSA say an N95 respirator or better is required. Uh, if you don't have any, then uh, you do your best, use a face shield, use uh, 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 um, where was I? I'm sorry, I just got a phone call. So we're anywhere down here. Everybody says use an N95 or better for AGP care. IDSA says you can use a decontaminated or reprocessed um, N95. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes in more detail. CDC does not, uh, does not allow that under their guidelines. Okay, so N95 extended use. In, a, in contingency or crisis settings, there's this idea of using the same N95 for different patients without removing the thing. So you could, in theory, wear this all day. And in fact, for routine care, no AGPs, CDC says up to 12 hours. Now, I don't know if you could, I've never tried to wear an N95 for 12 hours. Uh, I suppose if I didn't, if that was the only one I had that day, I'd do it. But it, it may be difficult to do. Anyway, CDC says um, extended care up to 12 hours. CDC says you should not either, you should not reuse an, an N95 after an extended period of use. And the reason why they say that is over concern that the front of the N95 will become so contaminated that there'll be a, a high risk of contact transmission through your hands or into your, into your eyes. For AGP care, <coughs> um, the IDSA says use a face shield or a surgical mask over your N95 to allow for extended use. In other words, to prevent um, uh, to, to reduce the amount of contamination of that N95 respirator by having either a face shield like the obstetrician was doing or a surgical mask over the N95. Um, on the other hand, the CDC says that you should discard your N95 after any, after any care that involves an AGP. And that again is because CDC feels that particularly with aerosol generating procedures, the contamination of the front of the N95 is so high that you shouldn't try to reuse it because of the risk of contact transmission through your face to your, or through your hands to your face or from the mask to your face as you put the thing on, take the thing off. Uh, however, again, IDSA says use a face shield or cover your N95 to prevent that high level contamination. This again goes back to the critical point that if you're gonna use any of this stuff, but particularly if you're gonna reuse it or use it for an extended period, that you use it correct. Um, incorrect use can completely negate the technical performance of the equipment. Okay, so there's extended use, which is keeping this thing on uh, between, uh, between different patients for up to 12 hours. And then there's reuse. And reuse is using the same N95 for multiple patients, but removing it between patients. And there are different ways that are recommended to do this. Um, but in any case, how many times can you of the, of the N95 says you can use it, say, 20 times. You should not use it more than five times. Again, unless the manufacturer allows more. That's CDC guidelines. IDSA doesn't address this. CDC um, suggests a um, conservation measure being to take, to give uh, every healthcare worker in your clinic five N95 masks. And after using it for one day, you put the mask in a paper bag and you let it sit there for five days. You use the next mask the next day, put that in the paper bag and you rotate these. And the reason for this is that some uh, very uh, uh, well-performed studies have shown that the virus remains viable for up to 72 hours. So if you keep it in a paper bag for five days, there will not be viable 
virus particles on that mask the next time you use it. You still have to be careful with it, but there shouldn't be any viable partic viral particles on that mask after five days. Uh, for AGP care, again, use a face shield or surgical mask over the N95 to allow for reuse. That's the IDSA recommendation. The CDC, as was the case with extended use, also prohibits or doesn't recommend N95 reuse after a an AGP, again, based on this high contamination of the face of the respirator and the risk of contact transmission. Again, some subtle differences uh, between these two particular sets of guidelines. And uh, it's probably the case that, that both are reasonable guidelines to use. Okay, so some considerations for both extended and reuse of an N95. Again, consider that the front of that respirator is contaminated with virus. And you would expect this. That's the reason why you wear it. Uh, you wear it to filter out on the front of the mask viral particles in the air so they don't get to you. Uh, in general, extended use is favored because there's less touching of the mask. Taking a mask off and putting it back on does put you, especially taking it off, uh, does put you at risk for contact transmission. Uh, however, that also means that if you're going to use this thing for 12 hours, you can't be touching the mask during that 12 hours or your fingers, whether they're gloved or not, uh, become contaminated. Again, consider using a face shield or a surgical mask over the N95 to reduce that contamination. Uh, use the proper technique with gloves to put on and take off the PPE. And as, as I mentioned, there are those two um, sets of guidelines for how you do it uh, that are on that slide earlier on. Use uh, up to five times unless the manufacturer allows more uh, each one should be used by one healthcare worker only if possible. Now, if the thing becomes grossly contaminated with blood, uh, respiratory secretions, other body fluids, throw the thing away. And also, critically for an N95, these things do break down after a while. The elastic becomes uh, uh, ineffective. If it no longer fits properly, you have to throw it away. Because remember, the an N95, part of the key is to have a good seal around your, around your face. Okay, now there's the, the whole issue of decontamination or reprocessing. <clears throat> I know in a, a lot of hospitals here, they tried this. There are only a few methods that are, uh, that are approved, and I doubt any of these are gonna make, uh, be relevant to you, but I'll mention them anyway. One is ultraviolet radiation. It's very labor intense. You've gotta turn the things over. You have to have special equipment. Uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide and moist heat. Probably not very, not very useful for you, I would guess. Um, and so that, that technique of having five masks or five uh, uh, respirators per healthcare worker and rotating them, keeping each one in a paper bag for five days so the virus particles can become non-viable is probably the, the best approach rather than uh, the more practical approach for you rather than trying to decontaminate or reprocess the things. Uh, okay, so in the contingency or crisis settings, um, decontaminated N95s can be used by healthcare workers providing uh, care for patients that does not involve HEPs. Both IDSA and CDC agree on that. Uh, IDSA says that a reprocessed N95 should be used instead of a surgical mask for care that includes an AGP. Now this is a little bit different from what we talked about where the surgical mask and the N95 are equivalently effective. For, for, AG, <clears throat> for aerosol gen procedures, they're not. Uh, an N95 is definitely better than a surgical mask if you're gonna have a procedure that produces a lot of aerosols because a surgical mask simply doesn't remove those from the air. Um, CDC says that a decontaminated or reprocessed N95 should be used for care that involves an AGP only if information from the manufacturer says that decant contamination does not reduce respirator performance. And this issue of differences in durability and performance 
between different models or uh, makes of N95 is, is critical. What's been found here is that certain manufacturers' uh, products simply haven't met uh, very high standards for durability or for base sort of baseline uh, uh, quality to the point where the products made by some manufacturers have been banned by the, the US Food and Drug Administration as being ineffective. Okay, surgical masks, uh, as we mentioned before, they can be used for routine care if it doesn't involve AGPs, as directed. Now the IDSA doesn't really say much about that, but again, recall that the CDC says, if you wanna use a surgical mask, uh, you should have the patient wear a mask as well. Uh, they're not recommended for aerosol generated procedure care by either organization. And both organizations stress trying to use engineering and administrative controls to reduce the need for surgical masks, reduce the demand. Uh, in contingency settings, possible shortages, consider extended use of a surgical mask with all the same considerations for N95. In a crisis setting, consider limited reuse. Same considerations, store five days between uses to allow viral particles to become non-viable. And as I mentioned before, decontamination, washing, or reprocessing of surgical masks is not recommended because they're simply not that, not that durable. Uh, face masks for and face covers and masks for virus source control. This would be like keeping somebody who has the disease from spewing it out. Uh, this can be useful for patients, for families, for visitors. Um, and at least here in, in the hospital uh, where, where I work, everybody has to wear a face cover of some kind, no matter where they work. Uh, different varieties. If they don't have patient care, they can wear a, a homemade cloth cover. Uh, people who have patient care need to use a medical or surgical mask and so on. Uh, they can be surgical masks if the supply allows, but uh, at least the experience here is that the supply doesn't allow that. Uh, cloth face covers can be used uh, oftentimes provided by the users, the people, the families, and so on. And, and here, a lot of people are walking around with uh, designer, you know, designer face covers or things they make themselves or just bandanas. And as mentioned before, the masks on the patients as source control allow clinical staff to use surgical masks rather than non N, rather than N95s for care that does not include an aerosol generated procedure. Face shields and eye protection, uh, again, they, they enhance the protection from surgical masks. The obstetrician you saw early on was getting really good protection from both an N95 and a face shield. They can be used to reduce the contamination of N95s and allow either extended or reuse. They can be decontaminated and reused many times, uh, basically until they fall apart or until you can't see through them. But they should again be considered contaminated after every use and handled appropriately with gloves uh, and, and hand hygiene, washing your hands before and after using. Gowns, don't know what, what, not much to say about gowns, except if there's a shortage, everybody here is trying to use cloth gowns rather than the paper disposable ones. Um, again, use them until they're either visibly so soiled or they fall apart, probably up to one shift. You may have to use them for more than that. And they should probably be used by a single healthcare worker and not spread, not shared by others. But that may not be possible in some settings. You do your best. Gloves, sterile gloves not generally needed unless you're doing a procedure. The IDSA looked at the issue of double gloving versus single gloving and found that double, there was no evidence that double gloving is uh, necessary or gives any advantage. And it, just keep in mind that a contaminated glove is just as dangerous as a contaminated finger. That wearing a glove and then touching either your, uh, your face or your face shield or your uh, N95 respirator or surgical mask is just like touching those things with a finger that's contaminated. The glove doesn't really do anything. Hand hygiene is still critical even when using gloves. Don't forget, 
put it on and take it off properly, use those, the guidelines uh, on those two websites. All PPE is considered contaminated after use. Healthcare workers should always use a surgical mask or an N95. One thing that is unequivocal is that everybody who takes care of a COVID patient needs to have some kind of respiratory protection, be it an N95 or a surgical mask. Try to maintain distance, try to use uh, you know, soap and water or hand sanitizer for regular hand cleaning. And as always, keep your hands away from your face. You know, these are the things we've been talking about since the very first days of the pandemic. And they are still as necessary now as they were then. Okay, that's the end of what I have on uh, PPE. Now, as luck would, this, we'll get down to the triage issue. As luck would have it, the other night I was gonna start making slides on, on uh, triage, and I happened to find this set of slides from the US CDC that pretty much talked about everything I wanted to talk about. It talked about everything we had put in place in our clinic in Cucuta, Colombia. Um, so I thought, hey, you know, these slides are prettier than mine. And besides, it's a whole lot less trouble. I made a few changes. So let's, uh, let's just go through these quickly. Uh, here's their outline, definition of triage, what patients can do, what facilities can do, what workers can do. Um, so what's triage? You know, sorting out classification of patients, determine priorities and proper place of treatment. For COVID, particular question is, do they are they likely to have COVID or not? And that's a difficult question. What patients can do. Now, I don't know what the situation is there in the camp. Uh, I don't know if people have cell phones. I don't know if the clinic has cell phones. But it's nice if a patient can inform their healthcare provider, their clinic, if they are coming to the clinic and they have respiratory symptoms, if they can call ahead. Again, I don't know that's, if that's practical where you are. Uh, they should always wear a face mask. Um, maintain social distance. Immediately go to registration. Tell them they have respiratory symptoms. Carry tissue. Uh, try to cover their mouth. And wash hands, hopefully, at a hand washing station at the clinic. What can the facilities do? Now they can communicate with patients before they arrive, uh, if possible. They can set up a, an appropriate triage area. We'll talk about that in a second. They can set up a respiratory waiting area. If people come to triage and, are, and uh, say they have respiratory symptoms, they shouldn't be put into the, the waiting, the, the regular waiting room. They should be sent someplace just for people who have uh, respiratory symptoms but it's critical how you do that. We'll talk about that in just a second. You need to establish the triage process and especially to train staff on infection prevention and control, including the proper use of PPE. Uh, okay, well, again, I doubt this, if this is practical for you, it'd be interesting to know if, if it is practical. I know at least in every refugee camp I've worked in, every setting people have, a lot of them have cell phones, so it's maybe, maybe possible. But consider establishing some sort of hotline for patients to call before they arrive and perhaps being able to take care of whatever their problem is just over the phone. Um, use uh, mass media to tell people about all this and consider, this, consider telemedicine um, for clinical support. Maybe you can do this, I don't know. I don't think, uh, again, certainly in, in Colombia, this could be done. In Greece, uh, this could have been done for most people since virtually everybody had a cell phone. Set up and equip your triage area. Make sure it's clear where it is, post signs for patients with respiratory symptoms to report to the registration desk. If possible, consider having a separate registration desk for patients with respiratory symptoms. That way you don't have people who might have COVID mixing in with all of your other uh, clinic patients at the registration desk. Um, when you set up your triage area, um, have face masks and paper tissues at the registration desk, physical barriers maybe to protect your triage personnel or proper PPE as was the case I showed you with our, our people in Colombia. 
maintaining at least a meter, at least a meter distance, a place to wash hands, a place to throw stuff away. And then a respiratory waiting room. We'll get to that again in just a second. Here is the uh, the outdoor triage area at our clinic in Cucuta, Colombia. You see, it's it's outside. Uh, these people are waiting. Uh, the clinic and the main clinic entrance is right here. We try to keep people with respiratory symptoms out of that main clinic area. There's also right here. We were using a, another set of rooms to take care of respiratory patients. But the problem there was that there was no vent, there was really poor ventilation. So we tried to do as much as we could outside. And of course, everybody was wearing the right stuff, including the patients. Uh, again, you can put all kinds of visual alerts and things out about cough adequate etiquette, disposal of contaminated items and hand hygiene. Okay, so this respiratory waiting area idea, important, a separate well-ventilated area, maybe outside, where patients who are at high risk for COVID-19 can wait. It should have distance between where people are sitting. There should be dedicated toilets and hand hygiene stations. There should be paper tissue, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, trash bin. It should be clearly signed. Now remember that even if somebody has respiratory symptoms, a cough, they don't necessarily have COVID. In fact, they probably don't. So you don't want to mix your people who have a common cold too closely with those who, who actually do have COVID. And you're not gonna know who those are at, at this stage. So you need to maintain distance as always, and hopefully uh, have it in a very well-ventilated area possibly outside. I would guess in Bangladesh, it's warm enough. You could do that outside quite well, just as it is in Kukuta. Uh, assign dedicated clinical staff to do the triage, train them how to do it, and use a standard algorithm. And there are two that are in the slide set. Uh, there's one for communities where there is no major transmission. I deleted those slides because you have community transmission. And the other is for widespread COVID community transmission. So that's here. And so here's your general flow uh, in your triage. Identify signs and symptoms of respiratory infection, a fever, or a history of fever, and at least one sign or symptom of respiratory disease, like a cough or shortness of breath. In this case, if they don't have that, they get sent over for the regular triage. If yes, they get a face mask put on, they're kept separate from the rest of the patients in the clinic. And people, the uh, staff are notified that you have somebody who may be at higher risk. Now this is an issue of which symptoms you use as your screening questions. Um, because it, as, as you know, the list of symptoms caused by this virus is long and, and always getting longer and it includes a wide variety of things. And so probably just asking for, for fever uh, and fever and cough or shortness of breath is not a very sensitive screening uh, set of screening questions. This, uh, this is one and there are a whole bunch of different sets out there, but this is uh, what I pulled up from the Irish, Irish Health Protection Surveillance Center, their clinical case definitions. And here's the link to that right there. Uh, the first definition they use is acute respiratory infection, which is sudden onset, at least one of the symptoms of cough, fever, shortness of breath, or sudden onset of the inability to smell, the inability to taste, or, or disordered taste, which, as you know, is a are, are, um, uh, fairly interesting symptoms of COVID, and no other known etiology that fully explains the clinical presence, those clinical, that clinical picture. Or another clinical case definition, uh, any acute respiratory tract infection with close contact with a uh, COVID case in the 14 days prior to onset of symptoms. That doesn't have anything about the uh, smell or taste symptoms. 
And the third, the, the third of their clinical case definitions is acute respiratory infection, uh, the sudden onset of anosmia, agusia, and dysgeusia, and having been a resident or a staff member in the 14 days prior to symptom onset in a residential institution for vulnerable people where COVID has been confirmed. That would be like a nursing home or an orphanage or something of that sort. Now, the thing with clinical case definitions, this is before you have any laboratory, before you've done any physical exam, is that you can design these things to be uh, either very sensitive, in other, in other words, they'll pick up uh, more of the uh, COVID-19 cases than, in other, than they otherwise would. But if they're more sensitive, they tend to be less specific. In other words, they, they, they pick up things that are actually not COVID and suggest that maybe they are. So there's always this balance of sensitivity and specificity uh, and also things of predictive value. If somebody meets the clinical case definition, how likely is it that they actually have it? Or if they don't meet the clinical case definition, how likely is it that they actually don't have it? And these are all statistical epidemiologic uh, uh, issues that have to be considered when you um, design your, uh, your triage program and which clinical case definition you use. You're, 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 and there's no perfect one, unfortunately. So consider that carefully. Uh, the triage process, follow the appropriate algorithm. Important to give a face mask to patients with respiratory symptoms, that's to do source control. Immediately isolate people uh, who are, seem to be at high risk for COVID in a separate room uh, with doors closed or a designated respiratory waiting area that does not put all these people so closely together that people who actually don't have COVID are at risk of becoming infected by people who do. Again, limit the number of accompanying family members in the waiting area. That not only uh, reduces their risk of becoming in infected by other people who might have COVID and who are sitting in that waiting area, but it also reduces the need for uh, PPE. Clean and disinfection, uh, they, the CDC says, clean and disinfect the triage area at least twice a day. Focus on frequently touched surfaces, chairs, tables, uh, registration desks, and so on. Uh, disinfect with chlorine or with 70% alcohol. What can health workers do? Adhere to proper to standard precautions for infection prevention and control. Be trained. Uh, be be very aware of contact and drop the precautions, as well as uh, airborne transmission precautions. Uh, make sure that you do cleaning and disinfection at least twice a day properly. And of course, if a healthcare worker becomes ill, stay at home. Uh, we've already talked about this, but it's, it's important to use PPE in the same way that we discussed uh, earlier on. If you have a uh, a, a physical barrier, a glass barrier. So there's no, there's no way for either air or respiratory droplets to get from the patient outside the, re the registration desk to the person behind it. They don't have to wear anything necessarily. But uh, if there is not one of these shields or one of these uh, windows or barriers and they need to wear standard PPE. Uh, this uh, shows directions on putting on PPE, taking it off. So this would be a good source of information. I think this probably came from originally from uh, one of those two, the CDC website. Uh, let's see. Okay, avoid overcrowding at, at the triage site. Cancel non-urgent outpatient visits. If possible, um, you know, do, do critical things like immunization and prenatal care somewhere else. Try to use, we call, you know, call it telemedicine, whatever you want to call it. If there is a way to use cell phones to take care of people before they come to the clinic, to keep them from needing to come to the clinic, do that. Postpone anything that's elective uh, and maybe expand hours of operation so you can limit the crowds. Now, this, just, this is just a hospital's respiratory evaluation center. It's very common to see these tents out in the parking lots of emergency departments. And that's that.
I thank the CDC for making most of those slides. And I thank you for your time and your attention. And Denise, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I think we have time for questions. I hope that works. Thank you. We, yes, we're running a little bit out of time, but Dr. Sancida has a question. She, she says every day in our uh, clinic, we got five to six children and older patients uh, with cold or fever. Some child children has fever and cough. In the triage algorithm that you show, uh, that patient uh, having these symptoms have to have a mask. Uh, currently, in, in at the camp, is that is not possible. So what, right. what can they do? Well, yeah, and again, as I as I mentioned, what's possible to do in the camp, I suspect, is relatively limited. Having never been to the, the camp there. I, I don't know for sure, but I, I bet you don't have a whole lot of resources. Uh, if generally they say don't, don't have kids less than two years old wear any kind of mask, they can wear a bandana, you know, a cloth, any kind of cloth thing, basically something that will um, catch any drop, the spray of droplets that are produced when somebody coughs or sneezes. Um, and it's been, it has been shown that any kind of cover, be it a, a cotton, uh, you know, a bandana, uh, a shawl, anything is better than nothing. But also if you have, and remember kids, you know, kids have cough and fever. <laughs> that's, that's one of the most common things we see when we take care of children. So the, the chance that they have COVID is probably really, really, really low if that's, if that's all they're seeing, all you're seeing. Also, Kids seem to be doing better with COVID than the adults. Uh, I think you're going to have to do your best on PPE for those children. And again, I would say if they can wear anything, a bandana, any kind of cloth covering over their mouth and their nose, that's good. But also keep them at least a meter or two away from other people. That's, that's not the, the best, but it's you have to do what you can do under the circumstances. And I am pretty certain you're working under very challenging circumstances. Okay, we don't, we don't have, to, thank you so much, Dr. Howe. We, yeah. oh, we don't have any more questions. By, by the way, I have a question. It, do you have access to any testing in the camp? Dr. Hannah, you can, you, can, you can unmute yourself and you can respond. Or Dr. Sansira. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Rehna. Yes, uh, within camp area, yeah, yeah. within camp area, uh, some facilities have for the uh, collection of the sample, and they can do the test. And, and how long does it take to get the test results back? It's a one or two days. Okay. Okay. And have you had have you had very many cases? Uh, within a uh, camp area, still uh, 38 cases. Okay. And have there been any people with serious, with serious disease or any, any deaths? Mm, yes, still uh, two dead. Okay. And were, uh, were, those, were those two deaths in older, older people? Uh, one one uh, male, uh, age is uh, 71, and an, another one, actually, I don't know about the age. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, it's an incredible challenge to work where you are, even under the best of circumstances. And this is a complication that is certainly not, not very helpful. Uh, I think you just have to do your best on all of this. If you don't have, oh, and do, do you have, do you have N95 respirators? Uh, yes, actually we have, but it's uh, limited. Right, right. So you're you're probably going to want to use some of those um, uh, conservation measures um, if you if you don't have a huge supply. And I, uh, again, I, I would I would look to the of the of the two sets of guidelines. I found the even though I used to work for CDC, even though I used to write CDC guidelines, I found the ones from IDSA to be more useful. 
because first of all, they were just about COVID. Uh, second of all, they were very recent. They did that literature review, I think in March. Uh, third, they keep updating it online. And fourth, as I mentioned, they really lay out what the evidence is for their recommendation. And in some cases, they say the evidence, the evidence is, is not very strong, nor is the evidence very good. But because the risk to the healthcare worker is so high uh, under whatever, you know, whatever they're talking about, they take the most conservative approach. So it's not just the evidence they look at you know, the risk to the person who's going to be using the PPE. I, I, would, I would strongly en encourage you to, to go to that website and, and just look it over and see what it has to say, because it, I, I, I just found it more useful than CDC's guidance, even though the CDC guidance is good. It's, it's not always the most um, easy to wade through. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, this is um, actually much, much helpful for us because of, you know, within camp area, our resource is very much limited. And uh, we regularly use the face, like surgical mask and gown and gloves. Mm -hmm. And uh, also maintaining the physical distance, like one feet. Right. And uh, as we can do... <laughs> Right. Well, it must be very difficult. I hope that someday I can come uh, work as a Met Global volunteer in the camp there. I understand that's difficult. Um, and of course, we're, it's difficult to be a Met Global to be a Med Global volunteer anywhere now since uh, basically travel to any place is shut down. So, but I hope to, I hope to meet you in Bangladesh sometime in the future. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahana and, and the team that, that, that attended this call. And thank you so much, Dr. Peter Hawk, to providing this. this it was my pleasure. Lecture. Thank you so much. See, see, you, see you sometime. See you. Likewise. Salam, Dr. Dr. Rahana. Goodbye. Salam. Goodbye.